This is a Religica production. R-E-L-I-G-I-C-A. I'm here with Kay Lindahl, founder of the Listening Center, author of The Sacred Art of Listening, co-founder of Woman of Spirit and Faith, and longtime advocate for the interfaith movement. Welcome, Kay. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I know that you've been practicing centering prayer for a large portion of your life. And you've said that this has been really transformative for you. What's the story about why, why you began this practice and how it changes or it transformed the way that you go about your everyday life? Well, that's a wonderful question. I've been uh, practicing Centering Prayer since 1991, so it's a long time now. And I came to it because there was a, a personal crisis in our family. My husband had been diagnosed with cancer, and we were both just stunned by that experience. And it's something that you never forget the day you're sitting in the office and the doctor says you have cancer. I knew instinctively somehow that I needed to have something more to help ground me through this experience and to be a support for him. I had a prayer practice that was kind of just skimpy, let's say. I would call it a little bit skimpy now. I didn't necessarily think of it that way then. For the first thing I found was um, transcendental meditation. Someone said, maybe you should try transcendental meditation. So I did. I, we both did. And we were trained in that, te- that technique. And I found it very helpful just to center me and ground me a little bit. And then shortly after that, we were involved in an organization called the Mastery Foundation. And they do a course called Making a Difference, a course for those who minister. We had them come to our community, which we had a a very young interfaith organization, and work with us just to see how they could help us. And one of the things that they offered in that workshop was centering prayer. They taught us how centering prayer. And when I started doing the centering prayer, I felt very much at home. It was something that my I really felt fed me and nurtured me, uh, and the way to go about being more intentional about being present with spirit, with divine, with God, and being able to listen to myself and to God, spirit, and also to, which also helped me just in my daily life. That's great. And I can imagine powerful in terms of wrapping with reality in front of you. Have you found that it helps with just your interactions with people in your daily life to have taken that time to ground yourself throughout the day? Do you find yourself being more grounded in general? Yes, I find that I, I am more grounded. And, and when I get off the groundedness, I have, a, I have a way to get back into it. In a way, it's a, a shortcut. Once I've been practicing for so many years now, it's, I can get myself re-grounded just by breathing and just saying, okay, you know, take a breath, get grounded, you can do this. And then it dissipates whatever was taking me off center. How do you think society would be different, you know, like culturally, were we to take these moments of silence or even like, teach our children in schools how to take these moments of silence or to incorporate it into like their daily life? Well, some of the schools are doing that now with children. I'll start there because they, the many schools, that they have what they call mindfulness programs. There's another program called Moments of Silence and they just take a minute or so Uh, of being silent and teaching the kids how to be still. And what they've discovered in that is that the children pay more attention in class. They do better and they can retain the information better. And they also discovered that there was less bullying on the playgrounds, that somehow just that, that silence cleared something for them, that they were able to cope with other things in a different way and when they got out of the playground. But it's just, it's pretty remarkable. The other thing, I think that when people take moments during the day to be still or to be silent or when things come up like driving on the freeway, which is Los Angeles where I live, uh, that area, so people do a lot of freeway driving. And so there are a lot of opportunities to get angry when you're driving on the freeway. And instead of getting angry, to just take a moment to breathe and to think compassion and to just, just be quiet instead of getting angry really sets you on a different path from the one you'd, you would have gone if you'd started, you know, do the anger. Why is that stupid driver doing that? They shouldn't do that and ranting and raving to, 
let me just take a moment to be silent here. Let me be, just be still for a moment and let me just get back to my center and drive, be present. I think about the traffic. I was like, that's probably a great moment to take to be silent <laughs> because you're stuck there anyways, especially in California. Related to I mean, the silence and stillness, a lot of your work I know has been centered on listening. Um, you've done a lot of great, great work with that. What made you so passionate about the listening piece? The, it really started uh, with my interfaith involvement. Way back around the same time that I started Centering Prayer, um, I had started a small local interfaith group, which I mentioned before. And one of the, what we really wanted to do was to get to know each other better. There were people from about seven or eight different faith traditions. Um, and we said, well, let's get together and just talk to each other and have, have some conversations so that we can be begin to understand each other better. And we wanted to make sure that those conversations were really thoughtful rather than the kind that could easily go to, well, how can you possibly believe that? My religion is, it has the answer and we're, we're right and you're wrong. Uh, it wouldn't be quite that direct, but, but that kind of thing could easily happen. And so it's just a really different kind of conversation. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. They're just different conversations because it's, it's important to have discussions when you're looking in an, in an agenda in a meeting, you have to come up with some solutions to problems that you're working on. That's a discussion. When you're in a dialogue, you're exploring. There are no preset uh, ideas of where you're going to get to or what your goal is. You're just there to see what emerges from that conversation. And so the, the distinction between dialogue and discussion, I think, has really excited me. And so I brought that to the group, and we, we use that as a way of having our conversations. And part of dialogue, of course, is listening. There are some people that I can listen to for 20 or 30 minutes. And as I had more experience, I know who those people are, and I can't listen to them more than that. I just can't take in anymore. And so in that, in that point, I will at, say, you know, I can talk to you for the next 20 minutes, and then I really, I really have to go. I can't listen to you longer than that right now. And just let them know and then follow through on that. Because really listening is a choice. We choose whether or not we listen to someone else. And this, oftentimes it's an unconscious choice. And then what it, but this, is, this is talking about putting that choice into the conscious, consciousness. It's making conscious choices whether to listen to someone or not. And I think it's really uh, a profound experience when you, when you know that you can do that and you do follow up on that because it just leads to much more in-depth relationships and deeper conversations when you have them. It can be exhausting to, you know, try to intentionally listen all the time. It's funny to use the phrase like listener burnout, but I feel like that's something can happen, especially when you're new and you're really trying to be intentional all the time. What tips do you have maybe to like help someone avoid becoming burned out of listening because that's obviously something we don't want to happen <laughs> absolutely um and, and and there is um i think partially it's practicing it's practicing listening another part is that it's not not every there are many many different kinds of conversations this kind of deep listening is one kind of conversation there are probably another 50 different kinds of conversations that we have maybe over the course of a day but certainly over a course of weeks or light or months and from social conversations chit chat conversations conversations when you're getting information conversations that are more of a, a debate setup sometimes formal debate sometimes less formal debate there are just an, any number of kinds of conversations and so this is only one kind of conversation out of the many and it's when you really want to have some kind of a meaningful conversation that you do this deep listening and creating relationships. So it's not something you're going to do 24 hours a day. I love what you said, because I think oftentimes we're, we're afraid of offending someone by saying, like, I can't listen to you at this very moment that you've asked me to listen to you. And I think you're right that in reality, some people think it's a gift to the other person to say, you know, I need to wait, but then you'll have my full attention. Do you think that you know, the burden of listening falls more on women or 
at least perception wise that they feel like they should be listening i feel like sometimes as women we're told that you're female and so you're a good listener or you should be a good listener which i think you know, like not only is that stressful for women but it's kind of degrading to men saying like you're you're not a good listener just because you're male do you have any thoughts on that that topic Oh, you've opened a whole Pandora's box. <laughs> uh, there is a, I think there is a, a, a popular conception that women uh, are good listeners and that men are not. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think, and I do think what you just said about that, it really dismisses men as listeners because of that cultural bias about men and women. And either when... Opening the Pandora's box is because there's so many, so many things to say about how women have been, women's roles has been prescribed and described and how men's roles have been described and prescribed by culture in different parts of the world. And so it just, it's just this whole big spectrum on, on male, female behaviors and who's to say what is appropriately male behavior, what is appropriately women's uh, female behavior. I do think that we've been acculturated anyway over the centuries. It's not anything new. We, we as women have been acculturated to the, be the nurturing and the nurturing in its of itself implies listening to me. Part of nurture is listening. So from that sense, but what, that is not just a female role. Um, and I, it delights me to see how, how many more, how much more men are being acknowledged for nurturing their children, particularly in this day and age, than they were just even 25, 50 years ago. It's a complete culture switch on that, from my perspective, in the United States, that we have the father figure is becoming more in, commonly and acknowledged for being a nurturing figure as well. And that's new for us in this time. So as far as listening is concerned, I think that I have known men who are terrific listeners my whole life. And so I don't, I don't think it applies anymore. And I think it's more of an individual. It's, some, it's more of how we focus on listening, our intention about listening, our commitment to relationship and partnership and connection. I think those things are more impactful on our listening than male, female anymore. I, I would agree on either side. There's really great listeners and there's really poor listeners. And I think you're right that it's, you know, like how we're brought up and the cultural norms that we're taught. And I'm thinking perhaps the transgender movement will start to change that. I and mean, the, the gay rights movement to like recognize that, you know, gender itself is a spectrum. It's not the binary, this, that, or the other that we, we make it out to be typically, um, which is also new. New and old because cultures, you know, ancient cultures didn't have those gender binaries, um, a lot of them. Indigenous cultures didn't have strict binaries. It was something that was brought at some point. Exactly. And it's, it's so interesting. I have grandchildren now that are young and in, in their, some of them are in their teens and 20s. And their, that their view of the world is, is so different in terms of that, in terms of gender than it ever was when I was growing up, certainly. And uh, it's, it's really quite wonderful how, how fluid they are in thinking. And it, there, it's because it's not, it's not the binary. It's, just, it's be, way beyond that. It's more than that. But that's, that is something that confines us rather than expands us. And this this expansive view, I think, is something that uh, opens us up to all kinds of possibilities and in terms of how we think about life in general, but certainly it opens it up in the, in the field of listening, <laughs> that it doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum, that listening is something that can be learned and can be practiced and can make a difference in all relationships. This podcast was made possible by Religica Allies.